Welcome everyone to ResNet Conference 2021 session, The Age of Extinction, uh, How Utility New Homes Programs Survive the Code Apocalypse. Uh, we've got myself speaking, this is Cy Kilborn. We also have Mike Berry and Andre Pujic with us. Um, excited to have everyone on board. Thanks for joining us. And we will go ahead and get started. So first, uh, what's this all about, right? So um, we're gonna break this session into two sections. First section will be just a brief overview of new homes programs in general. Uh, we'll talk about the current landscape, what makes a program successful, uh, and then also problems that programs are facing today. Uh, and if you don't know what a new homes program is, that's okay, we're gonna talk about that as well. Uh, and then we're gonna jump into a Q&A section with uh, Mike Berry and Andre, um, and we'll be asking them some tough questions here. So just a few introductions first. Uh, like I said myself, this is Cy Kilborn. I am the Vice President of Engineering at Ecotrope, uh, which is a popular HERS rating software tool company. We've also got uh, Mike Berry from ICF. Mike, you wanna give a quick intro on yourself? Sure. Um, Mike Berry, um, uh, Director of Residential and Commercial Programs for ICF. I've been in the energy efficiency industry for the last 20 years. Um, uh, I have a, a background in new construction. I'm a licensed builder um, and excited to uh, be part of today's panel. Thank you, Mike. And we have Andre as well from EI Companies. Hey everyone, uh, Andre, I am the model, uh, the manager of energy modeling over at EI Companies. We do HERS ratings, full MEP, uh, HERS testing uh, for all the big production builders uh, in around 11 states. We're now part of the DPIS team and uh, looking forward to this, uh, this session. Um, a lot of potential here with, uh, with new construction and incentives. Awesome, thank you, Andre. Um, so in part two, we're going to be asking some pretty hard hitting questions of Mike and Andre, just to give you guys a little, little preview. We'll, we'll kick one off since we're talking about extinction. Mike, what's your favorite dinosaur? Uh, I'm going to have to go with uh, an all time favorite Barney, um, taught most uh, kids how to, to spell and, and count, um, including myself. Uh, <laughs> How'd that work out for you, Mike? Um, you've worked with me long enough. You, you know, the answer <laughs> to that question. Yeah, good choice, good choice. Andre, how about you? Uh, I'll, I'll go with Velociraptor. A lot of, a lot of best friends, uh, uh, fans of that one. Nice, all right. Mine's a Brontosaurus, you gotta love those long necks. Okay, diving right <laughs> in. Thanks guys for playing along. So part one, we're gonna do a quick overview of new homes programs, best practices, what they're all about, what challenges they face, uh, et cetera. So, Here's, here's a quick overview. So first of all, what is a utility new homes program? Um, at the heart of it, you've got utilities that are often required uh, or incentivized to meet certain energy efficiency goals, uh, usually a state or federal regulation. And uh, in order to do that, utilities will create programs. A new homes program is one of those programs. And uh, essentially the utility will pay builders to build more efficient homes. All right, so that's, that's really what it's all about. There's a whole lot more detail that we will go into, uh, but it's essentially utilities influencing builders to build more energy efficiently using financial incentives. So uh, where do these things exist? What, what's the landscape today? Um, new homes programs are pretty prevalent. This is a map of uh, just general energy efficiency in, uh, by state across the country. So the dark states have uh, a better energy efficiency scorecard. And um, this is from the ACEEE. Uh, these, this map doesn't exactly correspond to new homes programs, but it's, it's actually pretty, pretty well correlated. If you look at the darker states on this map, those are generally the states that have new homes programs. Um, so a lot in the Northeast and the West and the Southwest. Um, I don't know the exact number, but I would say there's, pro there's definitely over 50% over of states have new homes utility programs, um, probably somewhere around 30 states 
And we're looking at roughly, you know, maybe 50,000 to 100,000 homes going through these programs in any given year. So just to put that in context, uh, there's about a million homes, give or take, built each year in the US. You got about five to 10%. Um, but if you look at ResNet HERS rating numbers, there are about 300,000 ResNet HERS ratings done every year. Uh, so significantly higher percentage of those go through uh, new homes programs and receive rebates each year. Okay, so what does a program look like? How does it operate? What are the different stakeholders involved? Um, this is just kind of a, a little bit more detail on how these programs work. A um, lot going on here, so I'll kind of walk, walk through this slide. So it all starts with a utility. Um, who often has an administrator or implementer by their side to help run this program. Um, those stakeholders, the utility and the administrator implementer will generally create a reference home and uh, will somehow have that integrated into a HERS software tool. Uh, the reference home will uh, basically serve as the comparison home uh, against which savings out are measured. Uh, the HERS software is used by ResNet HERS raters, typically. Um, there are some programs that uh, don't leverage ResNet HERS raters, but most programs do. The HERS raters feed inputs into the software and the software generates savings data to send back to the HERS raters. Um, the HERS raters also interact with the utility and the implementers. Um, so they send savings home and savings data to the utility. Um, and sometimes in some cases, they also receive a rebate um, for performing the services. Uh, and then finally, the HERS rater is typically communicating with the builder, um, providing predicted rebate information, helping them make design decisions. Um, and at the end of the process, uh, this is really the driver of the whole thing. The utility will typically write a check to the builder or the homeowner. Um, in, in a new homes program, it's usually the builder. Uh, and that check here, that's what kind of drives the process, right? That's what influences energy efficiency. Okay, so uh, if we look a little bit deeper at a new homes program, you can really break it down into five core components. Um, the first component is financial incentives, and we've got an energy modeling tool, which is often a real key component uh, to the program. There's a reference home or a baseline to compare savings against. Uh, there's quality control, and there's uh, some sort of streamlined submission and processing workflow, right? There's a lot of options for these different five components, but that's really how a new homes program uh, is, is made up. So we'll do a little bit of a double click on each one of those sections, just to give a little bit more detail here. So financial incentives, as I said, these are key. This is really the main tool of influence to get builders to build more energy efficiently. Um, there's a few different ways that this can be structured. So the most common would be three different options. Um, you, you can have prescriptive incentives, which is basically just predetermined incentive levels for each efficiency measure. Um, so it's, it's not about the actual savings, it's about what's done in the home. You can also have tier-based incentives. So if a home meets a certain level of efficiency, uh, then they will receive a certain rebate. So like the name suggests, you've got different tiers. Um, and then finally, you've got performance incentives or a pay for performance, pay for savings approach. Um, this is where the incentive is calculated directly based on the amount of savings for each home. So there are programs that utilize all, all of these types of incentive structures. Um, generally, in, in my experience, performance-based programs give the most flexibility and cost effectiveness because that uh, incentive is derived directly from the savings amount. Okay, next component is the energy modeling tool. So 
for a prescriptive program, not always necessary to have an energy modeling tool um, for tier based or performance programs, it's absolutely necessary to have a software tool that's calculating the level of energy efficiency. Um, so most programs will choose uh, one or multiple ResNet accredited HERS rating tools. There are currently three uh, that are accredited today. You've got Ecotrope Rater, you've got Remrate, and you've got Energy Gauge USA. Um, so all of them can work. The important aspects that need to be remembered for uh, a modeling tool is accuracy, uh, Rater adoption, if there is a certain tool that's being used in the market by Raters already, uh, and then also just program supporting features. Um, the different tools have different levels of support that they can offer to the program to streamline program implementation. Okay, next uh, we've got the reference home or the baseline. This is what is used as a comparison or benchmark um, to be able to determine savings. So it's a really critical aspect of the program. Uh, if you think about a program like an existing homes program or a weatherization program, you have the benefit of being able to have a baseline that's already built, right? You have the home today, any improvements can be, um, you know, can, can be claim savings upon. But the new homes program, you don't have that. You have to assume that the builder was gonna build it a certain way. And then you can provide, uh, you can claim savings and provide rebate for anything that's built better than that. So you really need to have some sort of marker in the ground. Uh, and that is the reference home or the baseline in these programs. Often it is patterned after a local or a national energy code. Um, sometimes with some regional specific changes that kind of um, blend it towards what the market is currently doing today. What's the standard market practice in that region? Okay, we have quality control. Um, this is really important because we're talking about real money here, and that money is coming from, you know, at its core level, it's coming from citizens like you and me, ratepayers, et cetera. Uh, and we need to make sure that these funds are properly allocated and that we're actually getting savings, right? We're getting bang for our buck. Um, so QAQC is very important in the uh, utility process. This is typically done um, by having several layers of this QAQC. So you've got people reviewing these modeling files. Uh, you've got field inspections in many cases being redone to check uh, and ensure quality. You've got uh, automated checks of some sort, ratio and boundary checks to try to catch errors, things like that. Uh, and then you've typically got a whole nother sort of post-processing step, which we call em &V, or energy measurements and verification, which is gonna be done by a third party. And they're going to kind of holistically review the program and make sure that the savings are defensible. So this is a, process that can be pretty time consuming uh, and it is uh, often uh, time savings to upstream the process uh, and uh, try to get some of those QA, QC checks happening um, early in the process rather than kind of at the end of the submission process. Okay, and then finally the submission process itself. Uh, so a program is gonna wanna have as as streamlined a submission process as possible. Um, this data needs to get from the HERS rater to the utility. Um, so that needs to happen somehow. There are several ways that that can happen. Um, some programs will have just a simple email-based submission process where raters will email files. Um, some will have a standalone web portal submission, uh, which can reduce some admin time but also can add hurdles sometimes for HERS raters to have to deal with multiple portals, multiple sites. Uh, and then you can, you can also have uh, the submission functionality integrated directly into the HERS rating tool, uh, which can often reduce processing time on both sides. Um, so the key here is really just to, to get a submission process that works for the program and make it as streamlined as possible to reduce time and improve program effectiveness. Okay, so that's a general overview of new homes programs. Um, looking 
towards the next next aspect of this uh, and towards the you know extinction piece of this session uh, i want to highlight a few threats to no home new homes programs a few challenges that programs are facing uh, that could you know potentially be existential threats here and tee us up a little bit for the discussion that we'll have with our panelists coming up next um, so really what we see is the key three challenges uh, that programs are facing today and will be facing in the future. Number one, lighting savings are diminishing, sometimes completely going away. Um, what does that mean? Uh, basically, it means that LED lighting is becoming market standard and um, builders and homeowners are um, using LED lights even in the absence of incentives. And uh, so that prevents utilities from creating programs that incentivize lighting and from capturing all that lighting savings. Lighting was a, a pretty nice chunk of savings previously. That going away will make it significantly more difficult to, uh, to capture savings. Number two, uh, energy codes are getting increasingly more stringent. The 2012, 2015, 2018 IACC codes are, are really pretty good um, standards to build a home by. Uh, and some regions are even kind of going above and beyond that with code, right? Massachusetts has a stretch code that requires um, a HERS 55 in many cases, which is, which is a really good home. And so when codes uh, become more aggressive, it becomes more difficult to build better than code. So um, that presents a challenge for new homes programs that are incentivizing building better than code. So, and finally, as these baselines get tougher, beating the baseline will, will require larger investment in energy efficiency. So whether it's dollars investment or uh, training or time and resources and creativity, uh, it's, it's going to be more difficult. And so cost effectiveness will be a challenge persuading builders to build more efficiently will be a challenge. So with that teed up, uh, we're gonna go ahead and jump into part two of our presentation. Uh, so we've got Mike Berry from ICF, we've got Andre Pugic from EI Companies, uh, and I'm gonna be teeing them up with some questions here to really just start a dialogue on, um, on these challenges and on new homes programs in general. So to get things started kind of in the category of just an assessment of where programs are today, a uh, question for you, Andre, would you say are new homes programs important to builders and to homeowners? And uh, if so, how so? Well, I think for the, the builder, um, it's important uh, as long as, as that incentive outweighs their investment. Uh, they're obviously looking at the bottom line. So if they're getting incentivized to put in a, you know, a, a 10 HSP of heat pump, they want to make sure that incentive covers their costs from going to the base, from the baseline heat pump up to the 10, the more efficient. So as long as it's covering their costs plus, um, I think they're going to be more than willing to join any incentive program there is. Um, on another part for them, it, it's marketing. They've got a, a higher efficiency home to market to, to the home buyer. So mm -hmm. that's going to help sales, uh, get the home off the market quicker. Um, on the homeowner end, I, they don't really see any of that incentive portion. Um, this is all front end um, prior to the home closing. So uh, I'd say the only thing that would be important to them is they are buying a, a more efficient, healthier home um, for themselves. Uh, but they won't see any of the, the financial benefit except in um, utility savings um, over the life of the home. Yep, which which can be pretty significant in some cases, for sure. I would think absolutely. Yep. Great. Thank, thanks, Andre. Um, and Mike, how about for utilities? Are new homes programs typically an important piece of a utility's energy efficiency portfolio? Yeah, I think uh, to kind of see how they kind of interplay the new homes programs you have to kind of take a step back and look at how they structure residential program offerings so um typically with utilities they'll have their re residential portfolio 
and in their resident residential portfolio will be all the program offers that they have that are available to residential ratepayers. And in those, you typically have kind of like your standard offers um, of which a new homes program will be part of that. Um, but typically the the program that showcases most residential portfolios is going to be your like home energy rating programs, your home auditing programs, sometimes referred to as H HES or HEA programs. Um, and the reason why is it's just sheer volume. You have more existing customers than you do have um, new homes. You have more data, obviously, on, on new homes than you're going to have on, ex uh, I mean, on existing homes as you're going to have on new homes. Um, you have a huge amount of of a pipeline of participants already on a existing homes program where new construction it's you're really dictated by the market and so you know if you have a, a banner year yeah a new construction program can bring in a lot of savings but you have an off year where you know construction's halted due to you know whether it's pandemic or political reasons or the interest rates start to climb um, once that starts to get impacted, it's going to impact that new homes program. I always think of new homes programs as kind of like that, um, kind of just that rock steady Eddie program. It, 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 you know, they've been around for a long time. Um, they, they have a good following. People like to participate in them. They probably tend to have very high retention rates for participants. Um, but at the end of the day, those savings that are coming in from new homes programs are being added to that residential portfolio. So I think the loss of a residential new construction program would not be felt for the reasons that Andre brought up, but also for the fact that they do bring in savings, albeit not the, the largest amount of savings in a residential portfolio. Mm -hmm. Got it. So, so to summarize, Mike, is it fair to say usually not the biggest chunk of, an, of a utility portfolio, but if the program goes away, the utility is going to feel it. There, there's going to be, you know, it's going to create problems. Yeah, and I think the, again, I think pretty much the, to what to Andre's point is that like, it's got to bring value. And I think a lot of new homes programs bring a lot of value outside of the incentive. Um, but I think, you know, for those long time participants and those returning participants, yeah, the loss of that program would be would be felt. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay, so this is a question for both of you, Mike and Andre, and, and let's start with you, Mike. Um, what are the most common or most important mistakes that you see programs making um, today or, or that you're even maybe concerned that they might make in the future? That could put them at risk of extinction of, of you know not having a viable program anymore yeah i think for me and i've been doing this for 13 years uh well 14 actually coming up on 14 this month um i think i've seen the cycle of a of a pretty mature market where there's new homes programs and i think one of the biggest things i see is that um leaving savings on the table um mm -hmm. A lot of programs um, default to just code baselines. Um, I know as a licensed builder, I'm sure Andre and other folks who work in the market, Raiders see this firsthand. There's code and then there's actually how the code's applied and, com and compl applied to. So mm -hmm. um, compliance rates tend not to be very high. So there's an opportunity for uh, residential new construction programs to um, create their own baselines, essentially their own user-defined reference homes that are specific to their region, much like we have here in Massachusetts. And those um, baselines allow us to capture the savings that are where where the code is not being enforced, and there there's that that little bit of savings that's left on the table, but that little bit of savings compounded over, we do about 6,000 homes per year can really add up. And so I think that's one of the biggest areas I see is that as a program matures and ages that um, we tend to fall back on the fact that as codes also become more um, stringent that we just assume that codes are being um, enforced properly and, and adhered to and, and understood. And I also think that that also allows for areas where you have successful relationships, where you have a codes and standards program that helps the market um, go up to code and then a new construction program that takes that project from code beyond. 
so I think that's where we see like programs being the most successful, but where there's also the opportunity for kind of missed um, opportunities as well around savings. Yeah, that, that's interesting, Mike. You, you definitely tend to think that, okay, we can only capture savings for what's, what goes above and beyond code. And I may have even said that earlier in this presentation, but it's a good point. You got to remember that code isn't always enforced. And so there's, um, there's influence and savings to be had even just getting up to code. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember doing a presentation once on code, especially on the stretch code, and I literally had a code um, enforcer um, never repeat his name nor where he <laughs> was located, um, once asked me how much of the code he had to, had to enforce of the energy code. Yeah. That's and uh, when, I, when I said, you have to enforce all of it. He said, no, no, I know that. But what, what if you were give me like four to five key areas that I should really focus on? And I was like, focus on all of it. <laughs> so um, <laughs> yeah. I do think that that's probably, you know, that's not the norm, but you know, those outliers in areas where that's happening, there's a potential that, you know, the program can assist with training and with support to bring people up to meet the code and then really push people beyond. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks, Mike. And Andre, what about from your perspective? Um, what are mistakes that you see programs making that put them at risk? Yeah, I definitely wanted to chime in on what Mike said about the, the UDRH on the user defined reference home. Um, I think the, the programs have to stay on top of, of that home that they're using. So on top of just meeting that code home, which some jurisdictions are really enforcing it, some aren't so much. Um, it's just getting beating that reference home. So they're creating essentially their own code home above code home. Uh, so I think I, I, I've seen programs that are using a you know a 2017 UDRH home. Um, well, that code's moved beyond that already. So obviously they're going to be above that. So you need to incentivize higher and and just keep updating that UDR, UDRH home. Yep. Yeah. So that's actually the flip side of the coin too. Is you got to make sure that your baseline stays up to date. You can't be paying can't be paying builders for building something that they're already doing anyway, or already required to do. Exactly. Yeah, and I would say one more thing about this topic too. That the other side of this is is baseline studies in general. Um, this, I mean, goes to the point you were making about EMV uh, around new homes programs. I think one of the mistakes that are made is that the typical baseline study that's done is done after code adoption. You know, you want to let, the, for good reason, you want to let the code's been adopted. It's been out in the street for a while. You have a good sample set of homes, but what you really should be doing and what I think we, we don't really do well is tapping into the Raider market and to, into their data. Raiders not only support program homes, but they also work with homes that don't go through programs that are just strictly, they're working with for code compliance. And that data, that data is, is amazing because you'd be getting real time information about where the code's being um, complied and where it's not. And then, you know, what ends up happening with code compliance um, and baseline studies is it's done by calling out the homes and going to homes after they've been built and occupied. And the typical idea is that the homeowner, when they get a call and, and someone wants to come out and look at their house, there's the potential that the homeowner may have you come out because they think something's wrong with their house. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're not maybe getting a really good example or good cross re reference of a cross section of, of what's kind of going on in your market. So I think that's one of the things that we could do a better job of is tapping into the rating community to get a sense of like what they're seeing because they're actually at these homes, these non-participating homes that we really need to use as our baseline. Yep, that's a great point, Mike. Okay, sticking with you, Mike, um, in the last slide, we talked about some of the challenges the programs face. We talked about lighting savings diminishing or going away. We talked about energy codes becoming more stringent can you give us a little bit of insight from your perspective on working on these programs? What does that mean for programs? How, how impactful is it for them and how does it impact them in general? Yeah, I mean, you kind of touched upon this too in your, your slide size that I think for a long time, I mean, these are market transformation programs and I think for a long time, um, 
utility programs, like especially new construction ones, we've, we've kind of hung our hat on the savings uh, that we receive from lighting. And now that LED lighting is, is the norm, uh, congratulations, we've transformed the market. Um, we need to adjust for that. And it, it's a little shocking to me sometimes to, to see that folks seem surprised that like lighting savings are going to go away or the impact that more stringent energy codes can have on um, on programs. And so I think one of the things is that programs really need to think about pivoting prior to the, you know, prior to a change. It, it goes back to that, you know, way overused Wayne Gretz quote of like, you know, a good hockey player skates to where the puck is and a great hockey player skates to where the puck's going to be. And I think a good new homes program will adjust when things change, but I think a great new homes program is going to adjust when they sense the change coming. Like, are we getting to the point now that lighting is, is you know, going to go away within the next year? And if so, what do we backfill those savings in with? And I think the way you figure that out too is you also have to keep your finger on the pulse of the building community and your participants, which include again, your readers, all your stakeholders, your, your market allies, the people who support your industry, whether it's insulation sales or, or, or building material companies or lumber yards, what are they seeing as trends? Where can the program then pivot to, to like capture more savings. So as one thing's getting ready to go away, you're bringing something new to the market. And I think that's where we see the, six, the successful programs. We've seen also, which I think is a shame, we've seen programs shut down because they're no longer cost effective due to things like lighting savings going away. So um, I, I really I really think that that's one of the big things is, is kind of keeping your 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 focus on where the market is going, where the need is, but I think that has to be done by engaging the market. And I, I think that's again where our programs are successful and where programs unfortunately fall flat. Yep. Yeah, and that's that's actually a great point to put it in that context, Mike, because we're talking about these as existential threats to programs. But when you think about a program as, you know, the, the whole point of the program is market transformation then you kind of shift the paradigm and you say, uh, well, this was what we were trying to do. We've accomplished it. Um, and this is a continuous iterative cycle for programs. Uh, it's not an unexpected or a surprise problem that we're encountering. It's a, you know, a symptom of success and we need to figure out what's the next thing. How, how do we continue to transform the market? Because just because of the nature of these programs inherently, they're always gonna have to change and find the next source of savings, which is kind of the whole point. So right. that's, that's a good point, Mike. Okay, um, let's, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about future challenges, um, not so much what we're seeing today. Mike, aside from lighting savings and stringent energy codes that we just talked about, do you see other major challenges that will face programs in the next, let's say, five years? Yeah, so I think it goes back to the first response that Andre gave around builders and knowing your your basically your market is, you know, I think what kills new homes programs as well, beyond those, you know, beyond the loss of things like lighting savings, more stringent uh, uh, codes and changing baselines is, is just relevancy to the marketplace. I mean, at the end of the day, builders don't want, you know, anything that's going to cost them more money or or more time. And so I think one of the things that ends up happening is when you start to see incentive levels decrease, you start to see the value in the program start to, de you know, decrease, which means then participation rates start to decrease. And I think one of the things that we see is like, especially in really mature markets, the, in the market I work in, our program is over 20 years old, our new homes program. And it's gone through so many iterations and so many changes that that's also something we hear back from the builders is like, it's tough for them to keep up with the program act changes. We went from a, a prescriptive program to a tiered prescriptive program to a program that offered prescriptive and performance incentives. And now it's a pay for savings program. And I remember once a builder saying to me, I participate in your programs. I never know what I'm going to get as an incentive. 
I just know sooner than later I get a check and I'm happy with that. And to me, I thought that's not that's not a good thing because even though that that builder is okay with it, there's a builder out there who's not. And so I think one of the things that you know is really important to keep in mind is that as programs mature is is are they relevant to the market and are they bringing value and i think that could be something like technical support and training um you know something above and beyond because unfortunately in, especially as programs age mature and and baselines change incentives are going to go down so it's it's now on the program to like what value are you going to bring to the marketplace beyond incentives and again incremental costs are going to continue to go up because as codes get more stringent, that cost is going to go up. Our savings are going to go down. Our incentives go down. So now it's like, so what value now does the program bring? And mm -hmm. I think that's the big question that needs to be asked like all the time is like, what value am I bringing to the market today? What value do I have to bring tomorrow, the next day, the next day after that? Yeah, that's a good insight, Mike. Thank, thanks for that. Um, Andre, from, from the other side, kind of thinking about the builders and, and how they feel about new homes programs, what challenges do you think they will face uh, as lighting savings goes away, baselines become more stringent, and it's, you know, it's harder to get those incentives? W will they be able to build above code? Will they continue to stay in the program and participate? Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, to tee off of what Mike said, uh, it's, you know, the cost of building above code is going to increase the savings is going to decrease because you can only get so efficient and then obviously the program is going to decrease um i think a big part of that's going to be the cost of technology the cost of manufacturing um how quickly can the industry start developing these newer technologies these more efficient water heaters more efficient hvac uh, how quickly can they drop that cost and produce cheaper so that the builders cost out of pocket reduces to to incentivize them more to join the program um they're looking at their their net cost per lot so they've got it's got a pencil up so mm -hmm. if we can if as an industry if we can get the cost of these upgrades down um I, it, that's going to make a huge dent uh in in the loss of savings or in the loss of incentives yep so really savings true, at a price. true market transformation all the way up to the research level and the manufacturing level to get these technologies to be more uh, more cost effective, more mainstream, and, and allow builders to do it cost effectively. Yeah, and I mean, and, and Andre brings up a really good point. Uh, you know, markets have a huge play in this, and by markets, I mean like, you know, in Massachusetts, the the majority of our participants are custom home builders in markets where you're being where you have a lot of spec building going on that's a little bit of a tougher sell so some of the national builders like Pulte and um and others you know it comes down to their bottom line they are sharpening their pencil and if the if it doesn't if the math doesn't work it doesn't work and you know you're going to struggle to retain those national builders into a program where i think a custom builder either comes to the program because they're their customer wanted them to do this. It's a desire that they they have. They want to build a more energy efficient home, or the builder can sell that additional cost. The additional cost to meeting maybe the program, um, the program like incentive levels, or I mean the program requirements to get incentives. I think it's tougher in markets where your vast majority of your, your participants are. Um, our, our spec built uh, national chain or, or local net chain uh, builders because it, it impacts their bottom line. I think that's a huge point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're, we're about to transition over and I'll ask a few questions about solutions and how we, uh, how we make sure that we stay relevant moving forward. But hearing you guys talk, um, it sounds like to me actually just the general industry of energy efficiency and creating this market demand, getting more HERS ratings out there, getting it fed into the MLS, making consumers aware and creating this demand for energy efficiency so that builders see the benefit of building more energy efficient homes. It actually seems like that could help new homes programs because it gives builders an extra kind of um, 
less direct incentive to build more energy efficient homes. If the, if the consumer is pulling it, then maybe the builder can, um, you know, they can justify putting in an extra 1% into the home uh, and the rebates will get them down to a half a percent. So they're, they're, they're still a little more, bit more costly, but the consumer wants that energy efficiency so they can justify it. So it kind of seems like those, those two are pretty strong synergies. Cool. Uh, so let's jump into solutions on that. And uh, Mike, we'll start with you. There's a term that gets tossed around in the industry a lot, especially talking about utilities and programs, this term called beneficial electrification. Um, can you kind of like demystify that for us? What does it mean and how could it be used or could it be used to help a new homes program survive? Yeah, I'm gonna. I'll give a. I'll give a like a an overview of beneficial electrification, and then um, kind of touch upon how it how it can either help or tip, not hurt, but could impact uh, a new homes program. Um, so to think about beneficial electrification is is primarily just replacing direct fossil fuel fuel use. Um, so think of propane, uh, natural gas. Uh, heating oil, any fossil face, fossil, fossil based fuels, easy for me to say, um, with electricity. Um, and what we're seeing is a massive push in a lot of areas in the country, um, regionally, locally, where you're seeing gas moratoriums, focus on decarbonization, uh, a real focus on, on lowering CO emissions. You have in New York City, you have local law 97, which focus on, on building uh, carbon emissions and lowering those over the next you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 years out. Um, you saw this out in California, with huge focus on decarb. And the way they're looking at this is, is moving, you know, what we would consider the typical home being built, you know, maybe instead of having, you know, a, a natural gas heating system, a hot water, tank, you know, and, you know, just heat, gas appliances going 100% electric, utilizing heat pumps, heat pump out water heaters, um, a lot of new technology. And I think this is great. And I think it's a fantastic direction our um, programs are moving in. But I think we also forget that a vast majority of our um, new homes programs are also funded by gas utilities. Um, and I think that even though we are, and for good reason, should focus on decarb and, and beneficial electrification is, is a huge piece of that. We also feel, I also feel like, especially in cold climates um, here in the Northeast where I live or, or anywhere else in the country that, you know, is, is predominantly a colder climate. Um, I, I think we forget and we, we need to continue to give love to our gas um, utilities out there. Um, they do a lot of fantastic work around uh, energy efficiency. They provide incredible incentives for heating equipment, especially because not everyone can do beneficial electrification. Not everyone is also sold on it, especially again in cold climates. I think beneficial electrification works great in warmer climates when you're more focused on cooling than you are on heating. Um, I think there's a lot of people that are still pretty doubtful that um, heat pumps, even cold, cold climate heat pumps, can really do the job um, that they're, they, they people say they can do. Um, and so I, I think that this is definitely the direction we're going to see programs going in. But I think the other thing is you see in markets uh, where you have multi-utility companies funding their new homes programs. So you might have a gas and electric um, utility funding that new homes program, if you remove or decouple the gas utility from that mix, and now it's just on the electric utility, and every budget is still pretty locked in, it's, it's pretty finite on what they've got, it's based on the number of rate payers they have, you know, can an all electric new homes program service as many people as an electric gas util utility funded um, program? can today. And so 
again, I think this is the direction we're heading in, but I think we need to do it with a little bit of caution and realize it's going to take time and then also realize that the gas utilities still play a huge role and will continue to play a huge role for some time in, in the work that we do. Mm -hmm. Got it. Th thanks, Mike. That's really helpful. Another buzzword in the industry that's being thrown around a lot these days uh, is ACA 310 and HVAC commissioning or HVAC grading. Andre, um, do you think the builders will take advantage of HVAC commissioning to achieve greater savings and higher incentives and lower HERS scores? Or is it going to be too cost prohibitive to implement this extra step to the HERS rating? No, I, I think the builders are going to be very receptive to the new uh, the standard 310 here. Um, m most of them, um, they've already got a HERS rater coming out to site. So they're doing inspections, uh, they're doing testing. Um, this is just adding to the checklist. Uh, so I, I think for, you know, probably for not very much extra cost. So I think it's going to be uh, a big hit with a lot of the builders. Um, we still have yet to see the exact impact per climate zone, how many points are you getting for this? You know, what the exact effect is gonna be on the, the HERS rating. But I think some builders will take that extra um, scoring on um, that better HERS score and take that extra incentive. Some builders might just take that that HVAC commissioning, um, take the credit for that and maybe back off on something else to save a few dollars and just take their, what their incentive might've been already, um, but at a cheaper cost to them um, mm -hmm. per lot overall. So some sort of trade-off where they can they can do this commissioning and relax costs elsewhere and end up in that benefit. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Great. Um, and, and keeping on that thread, Andre, um, sounds like HVAC commissioning could be a cost of cost-effective way to, uh, to to get that energy efficiency. Do you see other cost-effective ways that builders can build more efficiently and um, kind of you know continue to build better than code or is it really a problem of the technologies just aren't available for builders to, to do better than they are today in terms of efficiency? I, the technology is there. And I think as we discussed before, I think the, the cost of, of the products need to come down, the cost of the services. We've seen a lot of advancements in insulation, um, you know, closed foam cell, uh, you know, high performance attics, um, cathedralized attics. Um, so things like that will definitely help, um, like we discussed, the higher efficiency mechanicals. Uh, and if you look at California, their Title 24 program um, is well above the, the national standard. Um, they're making it happen. Their utilities are still having programs that are uh, extremely popular with the builders. So uh, we've got some time, um, but as we close in on that net zero ready, net zero, you know, that'll be a discussion down the line, but I think in the next, you know, dozen years, I think just as, as the costs come down, I think there's a lot of potential to still capture that incentive money. Yeah, that's, that's great to hear and, and good point to bring up California um, because maybe California is, is somewhere that we can look that uh, represents where, where we might be in five years because their code is very stringent, more stringent than almost any state or maybe, maybe any other state, and yet they still have a successful right. new homes program. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's a lot of hope uh, as long as we do things correctly as, as you know, program teams. Yeah, no, definitely. And, and like I didn't mention, you know, passive building, it's huge in California right now, you know, the passive home, it's getting all kinds of incentives. Uh, it's a little bit, you know, more costly to build, but it's, it's just the direction the industry is going. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, and I, I think to that point too, I mean, that's a, the passive home and net zero already. I think that's one thing that going back to an earlier question you asked about keeping programs, you know, um, I don't want to say relevant, but more, more like engaged to the building market and bringing value. I think that's definitely an area. And I think it's an area where utilities for a very low cost, especially something like net zero ready, you're not telling someone to build a net zero home. You're not telling them to put, you know, uh, renewables on site. You're just saying prepare to have the home ready to, 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 to move to net zero. And so something as simple as running that, um, you know, 
can do a PVC pipe from the attic to the basement, making sure there's room, you know, where the electrical panel is to put in things for renewable energy. Um, you know, just making the making sure the house is orientated right on the lot. I mean, little tiny changes. You're not asking people to to you know take a huge bite of the apple. You tell them to take a little bite right now, and mm -hmm. I think that's where we're seeing again programs being really successful as they're changing and, and instead of like requiring passive house they're training on passive house and that way instead of forcing people to go into like doing passive house construction as part of their program they're making sure that there's an infrastructure in place people understand it people are ready to go out and do the certifications to do the um to do the um inspections and and be part of the process so um you know i applaud utility programs that are doing things like that because they're again they're they're moving towards where the market is event or where they're eventually gonna have to go because of code um by kind of laying that early groundwork or absolutely yeah thanks mike andre uh, another question for you kind of piggybacking a little bit as these baselines become harder to be, harder to beat we've talked about you know savings financial incentives going down a bit just kind of naturally what else can programs do that may not be necessarily financial incentives to keep builders engaged and, and keep pushing them to build better than baseline um i i think like non-financially i i think just education and 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 helping them understand what why they're building better you know from a marketing standpoint for them to sell the home quicker and just to under, let them understand what is their homeowner buying what kind of what should they expect in in costs monthly over time um how is this home going to age I, I sold you an efficient home how long is this going to last me you know when's my next upgrade going to be expected so i think education is a big part of it um you know as, as hers raiders we can guide them on what's happening now um, as utilities, obviously they know where the cost may be going, um, where the demand's coming from. So if they could get involved in the home building process early enough and educate the the builder, I think uh, there'd be a little more clarity moving forward. Got it. Great. Yeah, that's that's super helpful, Andre. Okay, a couple of questions for you, Mike. Um, and getting towards the tail end of this discussion here. Um, and I think maybe these two questions are going to piggyback on each other. But first question is, uh, do you think that, so we, we've got all these ResNet HERS raters that are very often key pieces to these programs. Uh, do you think that new homes programs could take advantage of the ResNet required QA in order to reduce admin costs? It, it seems like there's often duplicate QA being done. Um, programs are doing QA and ResNet providers are doing QA. Um, is there an opportunity there or is it different QA? Um, no, I, I think there's definitely uh, an opportunity here. I think anywhere where we have duplicative tasks that um, are being done either on the program side or on the radar side, if we can leverage those and, and, and make them work, then I think it makes total sense. Um, you know, Programs are screened on cost effectiveness. Uh, part of the cost effectiveness screening is the program's administrative costs. Um, and so anything we can do to um, to assist with that and make the programs more like cost effective by leveraging any tasks that are being done by raters, I think is, is gonna only benefit the program in the long run. I will say though, that one of the things that I've, I've seen firsthand and, and I kind of, try to focus in on is that um, I'm a little reluctant at times to look at something as a reduction in labor costs as much as then allowing for a shift of labor. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of one of examples would be like my team um, does used to do an inordinate amount of QA um, to our, our data that we get in from our HERS raters. And um, by leveraging technology, we were able to expedite the QA process, shave three days off the invoicing reporting process. But what we were able to do is take those two to three days and do things like um, 
do more outreach, uh, research more permitting resources, um, determine ways to increase um, participation, but also like capitalize on additional efficiency. So um, I think there is an opportunity because budgets are pretty much set up front. So if a program is cost effective, especially in like a three year planning process, um, if you can capitalize on a, 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 an opportunity like utilizing the QA that's being done by raters, at least maybe while the program budgets are set, instead of reducing that cost because the program's already cost effective, take that labor and shift it to somewhere else where you'd want to be able to like, maybe it's researching a new technology or a new program offer for the next three year plan, but take that um, and, and capitalize on it and use it somewhere else instead of looking at just as a, as you know, a, a line item and, and a cost reduction. It can be a cost reduction down the road, but for that time being, use it, use that time, use that, that budget to do something else. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that makes a ton of sense. Um, we all want to, I think we all recognize that we want to be investing in energy efficiency. And anytime we can invest that in things that are creative and, um, you know, program innovation and that and, and program adoption, rather than kind of uh, repetitive tasks, things that can be automated, that's a big win. And Mike, you'll get You'll get the final word here. Um, other than that opportunity that we just talked about, are there two or three things that you think new homes programs really need to focus on in order to adapt, survive, and improve? Yeah, um, I, I think we've touched upon these and we definitely did in the last uh, question as well, but I think through the whole presentation, the QA, um, hearing from both you, Sai, and, and Andre um, about your points of view as well. I mean, I think the big thing is is stay relevant. Um, the program needs to stay relevant. It needs to look at folding in new technologies into their offers, um, keeping the program cutting edge um, and exciting to the market. I know that sounds like buzzwords, but they, they, they ring true. Um, you know, you got to make it worth you got to excite people to want to participate again, especially as you start to see maybe a potential reduction in incentives. Um, new technologies are a way to do that. Um, when you guys were just talking about ACA 310 and HVAC commissioning, um, I know talking to like the HVAC industry, um, they're, they're taking a huge hit to their labor workforce. Um, they're losing a lot of people due to retirement and the people that are coming in, the younger people that are coming in to do this work, they're going to be more focused on things about making their job easier, leveraging technology. So using things like, you know, apps like Measure Quick, um, you know, in the field to do the HVAC commissioning, you know, so now it's it's app based or it's on a plat, it's on a tablet. They're not going back to the office like their dad or, you know, their, their boss used to and, and be keystroking stuff in at night. They're they're doing it once, they're touching the data once. So I think, you know, it could be anything that keeps the program relevant, but relevancy is going to keep the program. And then I think um, bring value, um, you know, constantly look and see if your program's bringing value to its participants and also to the market. You know, your allies in the market are the ones out there also promoting it. So whether it's like I mentioned earlier, it's going to be the lumber yards or the manufacturers of, of building products. You want them out there promoting your program and, and you have to bring value. So you always have to think about like the value added proposition of why someone participates in your program or why someone goes out and promotes your program. Obviously they're out there promoting your program to sell more um, product. Great then help them do that. Explain to them why it's important with changes to the code, what their product brings to the market. Obviously, most, if not all new homes programs are product agnostic. We're not going to, we're not going to, you know, provide a certain brand we, we recommend, but we can re recommend a standard. And if that product meets the standard, again, builders will cut right to the chase and they'll be like, so an Anderson window three, you know, 400 series window meets the code requirement. Yes, it does. I'm not 
saying I to go and put Anderson windows in. I'm just telling you, yes, it does. So they're going to end up doing that. So if the Anderson rep is out selling his window or their window as part of you know meeting your code requirement, code requirements, and therefore your program requirements, it's a win-win. So I think that's going to be one of the big things. And mm -hmm. you know, part of that is is really pushing uh, new innovations, really focusing on that. And then the last thing I'll say, I think more than anything else is, you know, is is keep your ear on the market. Listen to listen to your participants. Listen to your hers raters. Keep listening because you'll be surprised what you'll hear, and you'll hear stuff that you won't know, you know, or you didn't know is needed. And so um, it could be a new program offer. Um, you know, we launched here in Massachusetts and I know there's other program offers now similar to it, but like a renovations and additions offer because customers were getting, were falling between the cracks. They weren't being serviced. And we heard that we hear all the time from our raiders where things could be better, where they could be, um, you know, where they, where we could kind of take them to, to service the areas of markets we're not currently serving. So um, I think this has been, I think this has been really a, a value to me because I've been doing this for 14 years now with the new homes program. And so I don't think we're a dinosaur yet. I, I definitely am not a purple dinosaur named Barney, but um, I would definitely like to be here, you know, next year, the year after, and, and you know, not make this my last ResNet uh, discussing new homes programs. Absolutely, Mike. And uh, yeah, th this dialogue has honestly filled me with hope for the future. Um, super engaging. Thanks to both you, Mike and Andre for being a part of this. Um, I know I learned a lot. Uh, hopefully you guys did too. And, and I'm, I'm sure that our listeners did, but thank you both. Thank Thanks you. to our listeners as well for tuning in and uh, hope everybody has a good day. Thanks everyone.